Lisa for the opportunity to speak here. And thank you everybody for coming. Um, some of you have heard me give a very similar talk many times over many years. So this might be a repetition. I do hope to mention briefly um, where the project is standing. This is a long-term project of which a, the biggest chunk is, well, the big chunk is done since a few years ago, and the last chunk is still in progress. And just over the last year, we've had a nice sanity, check, sanity check for that last part, um, which I hope to at least uh, mention. A little piece of mathematics that looks very strange compared to what we were thought we were proving, and it ended up being a feature rather than a bug, something that's actually a nice, you know, a, a yet another aspect of the non-triviality of our invariants, which we were very happy to, to, um, to uh, learn. So um, let me begin with uh, two, and, and this is of course joint work with Susan Tolman. Anything good that I do one way or another comes from Sue Tolman. Uh, and this is an actual explicit collaboration. I will begin with two uh, famous pieces of symplectic geometry. One is the famous um, theorem of Moser from 1965, um, by which a uh, compact connected symplectic two manifold. These guys are classified up to symplectomorphism by their genus and total area. And we can call these the Moser invariants. So we've got two symplectic surfaces with two surfaces with area forms. If it's the same genus, same total area, then you will find a symplectomorphism between them. And the second piece of famous symplectic geometry is Zelzan's classification from 1988. And this one is equivariant. So he's looking at, again, let me uh, compact connected. Uh, symplectic torque manifolds. I will give the definition later on for those that are not experts. And uh, uh, these are uh, symplectic manifolds equipped with a torus action. Um, the torus acts, let's say, faithfully of half the dimension of the manifold with a momentum map. I will remind you of the definition. The momentum map takes values in the vector space, the dual of the Lie algebra of the torus. And this is a vector space with a lattice. It comes with a weight lattice. So we can make sense of a convex polytope in this, lattice, in this uh, um, vector space. And it makes sense to say, what does it mean for the polytope to be unimodular? Um, it means that um, locally it is um, lattice equivalent, little, you know, locally it's lattice equivalence to open subsets of the positive orthans in RM with a standard data. And designs classifies these guys up to equivariant symplectomorphism and by their momentum images. And these are unimodular polytopes. And every unimodular polytope is obtained in this way. And the word complexity one that appears in the title, um, this uh, is refers to a situation which in some sense is a combination of Moses theorem and Delzan theorem, but they combine in very interested, interesting and rich ways. So I need to give you some definitions. I need to remind me you what is a Hamiltonian, a complexity one Hamiltonian torus action is a special case of a Hamiltonian T manifold. So I'll scroll down and start with the definition. So uh, what is a Hamiltonian T-manifold? First of all, T here is a torus. What is a torus? It's a Lie group isomorphic to a product of the circle group with itself finitely many times. And a Hamiltonian T-manifold is a symplectic manifold equipped with a T-action and equipped with a momentum map. And I will remind you what that means. The target space of the momentum map is the dual of the Lie algebra of the torus. And um, it, basically think of a torus action as K periodic uh, flows that commute. And we require these flows to be Hamiltonian. And the coordinates of the momentum map are Hamiltonian generators for these flows. So let me write this in a co coordinate invariant way for every psi which is the Lie algebra element in the Lie algebra of the torus, you can take the corresponding vector field, contract it against a two form, 
And let me write Hamilton's equation uh, where the function is the xth coordinate of the momentum map. So this contraction is the one form. This is the exterior derivative of the xth component of the momentum map. Now, usually when you say Hamiltonian T-manifold, it is equipped with a momentum map. Usually one requires the momentum map to be equivariant with respect to the coadjoint action on the target space. In the case of a torus action, the coadjoint action is trivial. Equivariant means invariant. And it's kind of, it turns out that this is automatic in the case of a torus action. So we automatically get from Hamilton's equation, we get the so-called um, 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 orbital momentum map going from the geometric quotient to the dual of the Lie algebra of the torus. And this allows us to sort of study the uh, manifold sort of one piece at a time or like little pieces of the time, semi-locally. If you have a, so here's the momentum map. And if you have a uh, point in T star, you can look at its uh, pre-image uh, inside the manifold. And then let me pick color. Mm, let's do this one, yeah. And here is a little, neighborhood of that pre-image. I'm going to study these little pieces, which are you know, not quite local, these are semi-local. So basically, when you look at classification, this is true both in Delzant's case and, um, uh, well, I guess Delzant's case, it's a little bit easier, but definitely in our case, um, typically you would start with a local classification, understanding the neighborhood of an orbit. Everything is equivariant, so the, the in sort of a points we're looking at an orbit, uh, then there's gonna be a semi-local classification where you're describing a neighborhood of the uh, level set of the momentum map. And then you put these things together into a global classification. That's the overall picture. And first of all, you need some sort of compactness. Um, you don't quite need compactness. It's enough to insist that the momentum map be proper. Pre-image of compact sets are compact. Uh, this will automatically be true if the manifold is compact. And uh, this guarantees that a neighborhood of a level set uh, contains the pre-image of a neighborhood of the point alpha. So when you go from semi-local to global, you're sort of patching together. This is like going from local to global inside T star. So there's gonna be some sheep theoretic argument happening inside the, uh, the dual of the Lie algebra of the torus. And in fact, living over the uh, momentum image. I'm gonna scroll and start saying a little bit about, um, oh, there's no neighborhood of orbit, saying a little bit about the local classification, because here for local classification, you don't need complexity one. This is very general. This is the local normal form of um, uh, Gilliman, um, Sternberg and Marle. So, and these are the building blocks for Hamiltonian, um, well, Hamiltonian compact group actions in general, but I'm gonna focus on the um, um, Taurus case. And the big building blocks are given by so-called Hamiltonian T models. So what is a Hamiltonian T model? So to obtain a Hamiltonian T model, you begin with a closed subgroup of the Taurus uh, and a linear action of it on R2L, or let me write it as CL, complex notation. And I can choose coordinates so that this action is through a homomorphism. Uh, let me assume everything is faithful through a homomorphism to S1 to the N. So we're acting by rotating the coordinates and then we've got a momentum map, a quadratic momentum map. And um, it, it is once you kind of chase the definitions, it's not very hard to show that uh, the quadratic momentum map will be given as a uh, linear combination. Um, of uh, the weights for the H action on C to the L, the, these weights really depend only on the identity component of H and the coefficients are just the norm squared of the coordinates in CL over two. Once we have this linear action with quadratic momentum map, we use it to build a Hamiltonian T model. You just take the torus cross C to the L cross, here we have the annihilator of the Lie algebra of H, and this is a subset of T star, subset of, this is the linear functional, fun, linear functionals on the um, uh, Lie algebra of the torus, those linear functionals that 
vanish on the Lie algebra of H. And this is a subset of the cotangent bundle of the torus cross C to the L. And here we have a standard product symplectic structure. And then we take the quotient secretly. This is a um, secretly, this is a reduction by the H action, diagonal H action. So here we go. Um, and this guy has a symplectic form induced um, on it, which we call WY. So there we go, there's the model. I wrote the formula. And uh, we've got the formula for the momentum map. Let me write it. An element of the model is represented by triple T Z nu, where uh, T is in the torus, Z in the CL, and nu is in H star. And the momentum map takes it to a constant plus the quadratic momentum map acting on Z. So this is a guy in H star, the dual of the Lie algebra of H plus nu. And this is a guy in the annihilator, H naught. And we have implicitly identified T star with the product of H star with H naught. Uh, more than that, if you sort of examine the formula, you will see that the image of this guy is a, is a convex polyhedral cone. The level sets are connected. And this map is in, topologically, it's an open map as a map to its image. Now we have the... Um, um, yeah. Local, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, could you repeat what is beta and what is nu? Of course. Uh, beta is just a shift. The target space here is T star, identified with A star cross H naught. The momentum map for torus action is determined, is unique up to shift, and beta is that choice of a shift. Mm -hmm. okay. And then nu is um, this guy. Mm -hmm. okay. it's, it's, uh, it's an element of the annihilator of the Lie algebra of H uh, inside T star. Oh, oh, okay, okay, thank you. So what does the local normal form theorem tell us? It tells us that uh, for every Hamiltonian T-manifold and every point in it, uh, there exists a Hamiltonian T-model. So basically it gives us local coordinates. such that a neighborhood of the orbit in the given manifold is isomorphic to a neighborhood of the central orbit in the model. And there is such an isomorphism that takes the point to the central, to the sort of, to the base point in the model. Um, basically, if you stare at this, like the, the, the group H is just a stabilizer of the given point X, uh, the uh, linear um, representation of X on C to the L is just um, the isotropy representation of H on the tangent space of the manifold at X. Uh, once you get rid of some uh, trivial uh, pieces of that representation and the proof goes, um, basically goes through Moser's method. So this is about the local structure. Um, one important fact about the global structure of these guys, let me start with a sort of global fact, global topology is a very, very useful so-called convexity package. And again, so far is this is arbitrary, um, Hamiltonian T-manifolds, no, uh, no dimension assumption, no complexity assumption for those who know the meaning of the word. What does a convexity package tell us? You take a uh, connected um, Hamiltonian T-manifold with a proper momentum map. For example, instead you can take M to be compact. Then, the momentum image 
is convex polyhedral set. In fact, it is okay, complex polyhedral set in the vector space T star with the with, uh, um, okay. Um, yeah. Second, the uh, momentum map is open as a map to its, its image. So open subset of the manifold, even if they're very small, they don't even have to be invariant. Uh, they go to relatively open subsets of the image, open in the, re in the subset topology. And third, not only the level sets are connected, in fact, but the preimages of, of all convex sets are connected. Um, and then one of sort of the uh, nice, uh, one of my favorite uh, <laughs> theorem, of, well, let's say same, one of my favorite proofs of this convexity package goes through a method of condo who does all know, um, which is quite abstract, which is where you show that if you have, an, um, let me not elaborate on that for the sake of time, but this, this, is, this is kind of a fun, this, this convexity package is a, is a fun, fun thing. Um, now let's go to the complexity, the notion of complexity. This appeared in the title, I said complexity one. If you have a Hamiltonian torus, uh, <coughs> Hamiltonian T manifold, here's our momentum map, and assume that this is connected. Um, the dimension of the torus uh, will have from the existence of the momentum map, you can prove that the dimension of the torus is at most half the dimension of the manifold. And let me be a little bit pedantic here. Um, if you want to assume, um, um, if you want to assume non-faithful actions, um, you will need to take the dimension of the effective torus, which is just the uh, quotient of the torus by the kernel of the action. And then the complexity, well, my earphones are falling off. There we go. And then the complexity, by definition, is um, how far is the torus, the effect of torus, from being of half the dimension of the manifold, from this maximum? How far is the action from being the biggest possible symmetry? Uh, by definition, complexity zero. That's the meaning of toric. So the word toric appeared in Delzant's theorem. Now, um, thanks to uh, Marston and Weinstein, we have the reduced spaces. Reduced symplectic spaces are the um, level set of the momentum map modded out by the torus action. Uh, the original two form induces a two form in the reduced space. The reduced space is a stratified symplectic space thanks to, to Shamar and Lerman. And the complexity is the same as half the dimension of the reduced space for um, momentum levels in the interior of the momentum polytope or in the interior of the momentum image. Another important player in this game, a little bit more technical, but very, very useful, is the duisterman hackman measure. And this can be described as some sort of a semi-local gadget. And let me remind you what that is, or tell you what that is. Actually, I'm gonna leave part of the previous page. This is actually, there's interesting motivation behind that measure. Motivation actually comes from geometric quantization, from multiplicities of, of, um, of uh, weights and the quantizations of these guys. But there's nothing quantum in this particular talk. So here I'm going to take a um, torus action, let, let's say faithful, of um, any complexity. So the complexity here is n minus k if the dimension is 2n for the manifold and k for the torus.
let me call the complexity D. And uh, near a regular value of the momentum map, um, you can use, Eris, like basically you can have an Erisman, um, can use an Erisman connection to um, identify reduced space, nearby reduced spaces with each other. And once you identify them, the uh, cohomology class of the reduced symplectic form um, then depends on the value at which you reduce. Uh, and this dependence will be linear. So in nearby points, um, and, and then the slope for this linear dependence is just the first term class of um, the level set thought of as a uh, principal T bundle over the reduced space. So strictly speaking, this is an Orbi bundle. So um, uh, this, this first term class lives in H2 of the reduced space with coefficients in the integral lattice for the torus. And when you pair it with alpha minus alpha naught, uh, what you get are elements of the real valued cohomology of the reduced space. So this is one version of the theorem of dusselmann teichmann There's various versions. The notion of the dusselmann teichmann measure, this is just a push forward measure, push forward of Liouville measure, by uh, the momentum map. So here I'm going to write absolute value to denote Liouville measure. And we can write this as a function times the bag measure on, uh, this is a measure on the target space on T star, target space for the momentum map that is supported on the momentum image. And the density function for the Dusselmann Tacon measure is just uh, uh, consist of the uh, symplectic volumes of the reduced spaces. And because the uh, reduced form varies linearly or its cohomology class varies linearly, uh, this integral is a polynomial of uh, degree at most D. And that is another version of the dusselmann teichmann theorem here, you don't need the mantle to be compact. It's enough for the momentum map to be proper. Um, and what we see from the uh, formula above is that um, the uh, uh, slopes of um, this momentum map, I'm sorry, the slopes of this function of, of the um, phi, of the Dusselmann-Heckman uh, function, the uh, radonic derivative of the Dusselmann taken measure, that slope is determined by the topology of um, the, in, in how does, is how, thinking of the manifold as being sort of vaguely thinking of the manifold as being a principal torus bundle over the geometric quotient, um, how, how twisted is the manifold over its geometric quotient? This is encoded in the slopes of the Dusselmann taken measure. So up until now, this is very general. And from here on, I'm going to assume that the complexity is one. Are the, so that this one tech one measure is piecewise linear. Are there questions so far? Sorry, yeah. Yeah. can you repeat the <laughs> statement about the slopes of this one tech one measure? Yeah. Uh, Basic. So let me make it. Let me write this down. Actually, um, I, I I just missed that sentence. If yeah, oh, okay, maybe I'll say it. Um, the the slope of the Dustrom attack one measure um, is is encoding the, uh, the topology. The, the the if you think if you think of um, so the slope of the Dustrom attack one measure encodes the twistedness of the manifold as sitting over the geometric quotient. You wanna think vaguely as if the manifold were a principal bundle. And so this is, I'm saying it in a little bit of a vague way, but 
Um, there is a way of way making this more precise. And the, um, uh, I said, oh, hold on. Um, oh, I may have said that prematurely um, because, let me be a little bit cautious. Uh, um, so when I say slopes, I am assuming complexity one. So I, in fact, I said that prematurely because when you say slopes, that's after we know the Dushman Tekla measure is locally linear. And second, the actual, the, in fact, the topology of M over M, you know, the uh, topology of, if you take the torus section on the manifold equipped with the momentum map and you forget, uh, forget the symplectic form uh, determines the dusumat heckman measure up to constant and uh, the constant is um, reflected in the symplectic area of the reduced spaces. Total volumes with the same as areas uh, in complexity one, the reduced spaces are two dimensional over the interior of the momentum image. So I'm already hinting at the next step here. Um, Yael, uh, yeah. maybe two, two questions. So uh, I don't know, maybe if you come out later, what do we know about the walls? You said, right, the DH measure is piecewise linear, so there are some domains. That's right, that's right. So, 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 so let me say something more precise and let me put the, and then if, see if that answers your question. Okay. So this is letting go. So now I'm gonna actually give you a, a, a rigorous statement, which is letting, so basically the first step, and this is what one of the things that complexity one allows us to do is to apply Morse's method and reduce the classification question to a question of differential topology rather than uh, symplectic geometry or equivalent differential topology. And I call this letting go of the symplectic form. So here we are assuming complexity one. Uh, the claim is that two complexity one Hamiltonian torus actions with proper momentum maps are isomorphic, that means, uh, isomorphism means equivalent symplectomorphisms respecting the momentum map, if and only if they satisfy two conditions. The first condition has nothing to do with the symplectic form. This is just saying that there exists a um, equivalent um, diffeomorphism, in fact, orientation preserving, that intertwines the momentum maps. And we call such a guy a Phi-T diffeomorphism. And the second is that these guys have the same Dusmatakon measure. And the point is, so this is a rigorous statement, I did not give you the proof, but the point is that um, the slope of the Dusmatakon measure, all the piece, all the, all the pieces of um, the piece, like all the slopes of those piecewise linear pieces will be determined by, if you know the guy up to fit d the slopes will be determined. And the only freedom that is left is, is, is a constant. So the same Dusuma technical measure in this con particular context, it's, it's, really just, it's really just a constant. So that's, so uh, Anton, I'm not sure if this answers your question. Uh, about the walls? No, 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 no. So uh, how the slope how how yeah how the slope changes as you cross a wall across a, a wall is a uh, so, so so inside let me sort of say this for the non expert inside the target space with the momentum map the image is a um, um, uh, is polyhedral if, the, if M was compact the image is just a convex uh, polytope but inside it. Uh, it, it is decomposed into chambers um, separated by walls, little pieces of, of hyperplanes. And on these, these, these chambers are the connected components of, of, of the regular values of the momentum map. And as you cross a wall, 
the slope of the um, uh, Dusselmatikma measure will change, but how it changes is governed by the equivariant topology. So if you know the, the um, uh, Dusselmatikma measure at a point, or the, the Dusselmatikma function at a point, then you know the Dusselmatikma function everywhere. If, 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 if you or if you know the phi t d phi okay okay thank you yeah and the idea here basically you apply Moser's method um, it's an equivalent version of Moser's method and a crucial point in Moser's method is when you take uh, so basically, you're going to take the pullback of the symplectic form under F to assume that it's the same manifold, the same t-action. And to apply Moser's method, you're going to take complex combination of your two forms. But you need to know that these complex combinations are still non-degenerate. And this is, this is where you have to use the, com the complexity one assumption. Uh, the next step is what we call um, passing to the quotient. So previously, the Dusuma Taekwon measure was already determined up to constant, up to shit, uh, by, by, uh, by the phi t default type. Here, the slope of the Dusuma as soon as you pass to the quotient, you're losing um, the twistedness of m over m over its geometric quotient. So then you need the Dusuma Taekwon measure to keep track of that twistedness. So once again, we assume complexity one. And let me give you a statement. Suppose that you have, oh, beforehand, beforehand, let me give you a definition. Suppose that you have a, so at this point, we're just focusing on a phi t diffeomorphism. We have allowed ourselves to forget the symplectic form. And we, we take the geometric quotients. And downstairs, we have a map phi bar. And more generally, um, a map between quotient, we call it a phi diffeomorphism if it locally lifts to uh, phi t diffeomorphisms. Um, and then here comes the claim. The claim is that there exists a phi t diffeomorphism between two given Hamiltonian uh, uh, t-manifolds if and only if there exists a phi diffeomorphism between their quotients. And they have the same Dusuma Taikan measure. So here we care about the slope because the slope will remember the twistness of M over M mod T over the geometric quotient. And maybe I should already say a word about this. Um, M mod T is a stratified space. The uh, orbital decomposition of M uh, gives us a stratification of M on T where the strata are come with manifold structures. There's an open dense set that's a manifold. And the technical aspects of this project, the technical complication have to do with what exactly do you do with the smoothness, um, like as you pass between these strata. Uh, Yael? Yeah. Just, just, just to understand, so when you're saying that this is, there is a diffeomorphism from M mod T to M prime mod T. So this uh, this definition, that's what you will be explaining now. This uh, what to what to do with the str stratification data. Or I have just I, I have just defined it. Oh, you you say that this is just yeah. there is a different. This is a definition. Yeah. That, yeah. So okay. we define we define a phi diffeomorphism between the quotients to be a homeomorphism that locally lifts to phi t diffeomorphisms. Mm -hmm. Okay. But because this condition is local, it does not capture the twistedness of M over the uh, geometric quotient. And mm -hmm. that twistedness, we will need, for that twistedness, we will need um, to, to watch the uh, uh, slopes of the Dusuma Taikan measures. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now let me say a few words about those orbit type strata. Um, so first of all, whenever you have a manifold with a torus section, the orbit type strata uh, are defined to be the components, the connected components of um, the sets of points with the same stabilizer.
So for each closed subgroup of the torus, you can take the components of the set of points with that stabilizer. These will give the orbit type strata. This will be a stratification of your manifold in any sense of the word that you choose. There's a lot of different interpretation of the word stratification, but this will satisfy all the properties that you want. Um, you can then look at the uh, set of orbit type strata. <coughs> in fact, each orbit type stratum is decorated. All the points in the orbit type strata, their isotropy representations of their stabilizer on the tangent space will be isomorphic. Um, in fact, will be conjugate. And that conjugacy class of the, um, uh, of the isotropy representation is a, is a little decoration that we put on uh, each on the strata. And the set of orbit time strata is a poset um, with respect to inclusion of one stratum and the closure of the other. Um, and this partially ordered poset means partially ordered set. Now, another little th thing is if you take um, orbit type strata and you take its closure, the orbit type stratum is a manifold and the closure is also a manifold. The closure is a component, connected component of the set of points that is um, fixed by H, but you might be adding points when you close. When you take the closure, you might be adding points that have a bigger stabilizer that contains H strictly. Um, and this, is, this closure is now, um, let's say in the compact case, this is going to be a, um, just a smooth syntactic manifold itself sitting inside the big ambient Hamiltonian T-manifold. So this itself is a Hamiltonian T-manifold, except the action is no longer faithful. It comes with an, the kernel of the action is H, but it still comes with a momentum map. Everything is nice and beautiful and you can look at its complexity. And um, uh, one of the properties of this Hamiltonian, sub, Hamiltonian T submanifold is that its complexity is lesser than or equal to the complexity of the ambient Hamiltonian T manifold. So if you start with a uh, Hamiltonian T manifold of complexity one, then the Hamiltonian T um, uh, submanifolds of this type, some of them will have complexity one, some of them will have complexity uh, um, zero. And these are the interesting ones. In fact, there's gonna be the complexity one is gonna be the whole thing actually. And the complexity zero one, these are, these are sort of toric pieces sitting inside this Hamiltonian um, um, complexity one space. Now for the toric piece, Let's focus on one of these pieces. So this itself is a symplectic toric manifold. And again, it, it, it's very convenient to assume that the ambient manifold is compact. So this will be one of these Delzant guys. And for these Delzant guys, the picture is very, very nice. Uh, the momentum image we said is a unimodular polytope. And, but more than that, the orbital momentum map identifies the geometric quotient uh, with this polytope in a very strong way. Um, the orbital momentum map is a diffeomorphism of manifolds with corners, with the, uh, the smooth structure as a manifold with corners. In the domain, it comes; it, it, it is induced from n. It's a quotient, and in the targets, it's it's a subset. It's a subset of T star. And under this sort of, uh, in this situation, this Delzant situation, if you go further and you look at the orbit type uh, strata inside N, these will correspond to the strata um, of the polytope. That means the relative interiors of the faces. So the picture that, that we then get is very, very nice because, um, and let me, I like to call this picture freckles on reduced spaces. So let me explain what that means. So now what we have is, um, I'm going to take a faithful action, complexity one Hamiltonian T-manifold. Here's the momentum map. Let's say everything is compact for simplicity. Uh, here's the momentum polytope. And here's the orbital momentum map going from the quotient to 
uh, that same polytope. Uh, and if you sort of focus on this for a moment, the level sets of the orbital momentum map are just the reduced spaces, and these are two-dimensional. Um, or, but, but you have to be a little bit careful, generically they're gonna be two-dimensional, but in fact, um, over each facet of the momentum polytope, um, over the relative in, or over, over the interior, the level, the, the reduced spaces will be two-dimensional. Uh, over the sort of boundary, uh, it depends. So, uh, on some uh, the boundary strata, the, um, the, the reduced spaces might be singletons, might be single points. So in this way we have, we sort of distinguish between the tall case and the short case. If you express the momentum polytope as you know, classified its point according to whether the, um, uh, its pre-image is two-dimensional or singleton, um, the uh, short part is just a union of faces, of union of boundary faces of the momentum polytope, so the close subset of the boundary, and we've got this disjoint union. And a little fact here, which might not be obvious, but this is true, if you're taking a point, a tall point, uh, the reduced space really is, topologically, really is a, uh, um, a two-dimensional surface. And on, a, on an open dense, on the comp, on, on, but, uh, and this surface is, is um, it comes with a smooth structure away from the lower strata. Um, so there's gonna be finitely many uh, points on this surface that we think of as, as freckles where, where, where you don't have the smooth structure. And this is where um, you know, the inter intersection of this, th these come from the toric strait that's sitting inside the big ambient manifold. They intersect, each short straight from intersect its, its reduced space only once. Then for the short case, by definition, these are the guys where the reduced space is a point. And uh, uh, and the freckles are just the reduced space intersect the toric strata uh, inside the geometric portion. So let me draw a little picture here. Here's the geometric portion, but I'm going to just focus on the tall piece. Uh, there are many examples where everything is tall. The, the piece of the project that's already published since a bunch of years ago are the cases where there's are all the points are tall, and you get very nice stuff, a lot of nice constructions, nice like good theory that really allows you to construct a lot of examples. The piece of the project of this classification project that is still that we're still writing is when you allow some of the boundary points to be single points, uh, and some of the reduced spaces to be single points. That's a short case, and that requires one more ingredient that needs to be incorporated in all in, into the, all the uh, earlier stuff. That ingredient is. Um, some sort of, I guess, a, a baby version of that ingredient is going to be Smale's theorem um, about, about the diffeomorphism, orientation preserving diffeomorphism of, of the sphere retract to SU3. So that's a very, but some version of that needs to be incorporated in all the different steps of the class of the previous classification. So here we go, that this little polytope, red polytope that I drew is just one of these closures of orbitype strata modded out by the uh, torus. The orbital momentum map identifies that quotient with just a, its momentum image, which is a polytope. And it intersects the reduced space in a single point that's a freckle. Do I have questions so far? So I'm a little bit behind time, so we'll have to see, but let me still move on. Um, one of the interesting invariants here, which turns out to be trivial whenever you have an equivariant Kähler structure, in fact, so this is really truly symplectic, is how do, does the union of toric strata sit inside the, the geometric uh, quotient? So uh, first of all, let me describe the geometric quotient uh, if you tear out the uh, short piece, if you only look at the uh, tall piece, let me call this m tall mod t. Here's the orbital momentum map. And this turns out to be homeomorphic to the momentum image across just a topological surface where the homeomorphism, the first component of the homeomorphism 
is just the orbital momentum map. And that will be the ambient. So we're going to fix such a trivialization. That will be the ambient space for what we call the painting. Painting is when you paint inside this geometric portrait, you're going to be painting the toric strata. So let me look at the toric skeleton. Um, so, sorry, Yael. yeah. So, so yeah. there is just uh, a surface of certain genus, right? You just say that it's always. Exactly. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So we are assuming complexity one. And then reduced spaces over the interior of the momentum polytope are topologically, they're all surfaces of the same genus. Um, and and you, you, you can construct examples for an arbitrary genus, I assume, right? Yes, for example, you can take any surface of any genus um, uh, mm -hmm. with an area form and just cross it with um, the two sphere acted mm -hmm. upon by the circle group. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That, that will be the, like the simplest example. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, or in fact, cross it with any symplectic toric manifold. So now, now comes the toric skeleton. The toric skeleton is just the union of the toric overall toric strata in the geometric quotient. Um, for each toric stratum, you're taking its geometric quotient and we're mapping this into the geometric quotient of the ambient manifold, just the tall piece, which we have identified with a, uh, so what is delta tall? This is just a, let's say in the compact face, this is just a polytope where you removed some of the, uh, some of the faces, the short faces. And again, there's examples where everything is tall. Um, and when you compose this together, what you get, the first component is just the uh, orbital momentum map. And the second component is, is interesting. It, it, it measures, it tells us how does do, do the toric strata sit inside the ambient manifold. Now, uh, this union, this toric skeleton is actually quite interesting because um, the, the, uh, 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 these guys that we have here, these are just the relative interiors of, uh, of convex polytopes in the compact case. And so what you get here is for the skeleton is, you know, uh, basically is um, just consists of a bunch of um, convex, union of convex polytopes. Glued along faces. And I guess in the, and in, in the short case, you need to tear out some faces that sit over the boundary of the momentum image. And the orbital momentum map just takes each of them and just and just identifies it with a with a polytope and T star. So now I'm ready to state the classification theorem. So this is um, proved in the tall case, and we're still writing out the not necessarily tall case. Uh, so let me first of all make these little disclaimers. So the tall case was the sequence of three papers. The last one was published 2014 and the general case is still in progress. Um, so the theorem says that complexity one Hamiltonian uh, torus Hamiltonian T manifold. So we are assuming that the manifold itself is connected and we're assuming that the momentum map is proper, uh, are classified, and this is up to isomorphism, meaning equivariance and plectomorphism that preserves the momentum maps. And these are classified by the following data. Now, all the data we've already talked about, and let me just make the list here. First of all, the momentum image. which is a uh, convex polyhedral subset of T star. Second, the Dussumatakan measure. Now, of course, this information is redundant. If you know the Dussumatakan measure, its support is the momentum image. And the Dussumatakan measure is piecewise linear. Next comes the genus of the reduced spaces. Next comes the toric skeleton. 
we, we talked about this one. This is just the union of the quotients of the um, torx strata. And this has come as a topological space equipped with the orbital momentum map and equipped with the isotropy labels. And again, we've got a lot of redundancy in this data because if you know the torx strata, then you know the slopes of the Dusuma Tecma measure. That sort of determines the Dusuma Tecma measure up to constant. And finally, the interesting piece of this uh, classification is a painting. That's the guy which is uh, trivial in the Kalo, equivalently Kalo case. The painting is this embedding of the toric uh, uh, skeleton inside the uh, product of the tall piece of the momentum polytope with this surface. And this is embedding is up to a certain equivalent because even this embedding depended on choices. It depended on the choice of trivialization. So that choice will be swallowed into the equivalence relation that we put on paintings. So what we have the, as equivalence relation paintings, uh, first of all, uh, if you have two paintings, I mean, um, they're equivalent if you have a homeomorphism between the toric skeleta that preserve the labels. And um, first of all, if they respect the map to the, um, uh, uh, the, to the surface, then we declare them to be equivalent, but we don't need to respect this on the nose. Uh, we are allowing a homotopy of such maps as long as this homotopy is through paintings. So this is the most interesting invariant. And um, that completes, the, let me maybe zoom out, that completes the, oh, I'm sorry, that completes the uniqueness part of the classification. What are the, um, uh, what is a complete set of invariants? There's also an existence part of the classification, namely which invariants can occur. So we give a compatibility condition, a local compatibility condition so that such invariants can actually occur from a manifold. And this existence part is really, really useful because it allows you to build manifolds. For example, if you start with a, a complexity one Hamiltonian T manifold and you extract all its um, invariants, then you know that these invariants are compatible because they came from a manifold. But then you can tweak the invariants a little bit. For example, you can change the genus, genus, or you can change the painting. And that will not destroy the compatibility so this guarantees that you can actually obtain a new manifold by surgery from the previous one that has this new genus or this new painting. And that you get sort of more examples in this way. Or you can shift the Dusuma Tecma measure by constant, that's also allowed. So the existence part of this classification um, allows you to build new manifolds, build new examples. And I think I probably do have a few minutes left and I would like to show you what sort of interesting phenomena can happen with non-trivial paintings. And this is really all coming from Sue Tolman. But maybe I will pause for questions. Uh, I think you still have... Uh, I have, uh, yeah, I have five uh, more minutes or six. Yeah, yes. Yeah. But let me still pause for questions and then I'll do the last five minutes to show you some non-trivial paintings. Uh, I was about to ask you about examples, but I understand, right? That's exactly what comes next. Yes. <clears throat> yes. So um, in, in some sense, yes. So the most interesting, so, you know, the first examples, he, so he, let me give you the first examples. If you take a symplectic toric manifold and you forget part of the action, you restrict the action to code mesh one torus, then it's complexity one. How do you visualize that? The symplectic toric manifold you visualize in terms of its momentum image, which is a, let's say the compact case. This is just a convex unimodular polytope in RN. And what, how do you visualize this restriction to a quarter match one torus? You think of that unimodular polytope in RN, you project it down to RN minus one. So that's the first collection of examples. Another collection of examples would be a symplectic torque manifold product with just a surface of any genus, no action. But let's see how to get some really interesting um, examples. 
So these we get from non-trivial paintings. So let's start by a, 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 a symplectic torque manifold whose picture looks like this. Now, how do you get that? Um, try to visualize a cone over a square pyramid and then truncate the top. So this is now has a top is a little square, the bottom is a, is a big square, but now also truncate the walls so that when you look at it from the top, so basically, you know, you might have something like this. I'm gonna erase this in a minute. And then you, uh, so this is the square truncated square pyramid viewed from the top. And then you sort of um, just take a knife and sort of build walls there. So uh, uh, what, what this gives you is a tall, if you, this looking from the top means that you're restricting your attention to its sub, sub two torus action. And this is an example of a tall complexity one Hamiltonian T manifold whose, um, um, hold on, where is this? Yeah, whose uh, skeleton uh, has some interesting topology. The skeleton has a pi one. Now, if you look at the painting of this guy, <coughs> whenever you hit, start with a symplectic torque manifold and forget part of the action, the genus is always zero. So the painting is given by, um, let me actually, uh, a map from this guy uh, to the two sphere. And this will be sort of the vertical component of, of, of the embedding of uh, the skeleton into the geometric quotient. The geometric quotient uh, is just a rectangle across the two sphere. And this is the two sphere, uh, the, the, the rectangle piece is just the inclusion map and the two sphere piece is the painting. So that's not terribly interesting because and any map from the square to the two sphere, you can homotop to a constant map. But now what you get from this theorem is you can also, uh, you can do surgery uh, 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 to change the genus to, to sort of, uh, to more interesting genus, reduce spaces of higher genus, have sort of non-trivial loops. And then, and, then, and, and then you can get a non-trivial painting by um, wrapping around a non-trivial loop in the reduced space. So this guy will not admit a, um, a, a compatible Kähler structure, for example. So that's one of three phenomena. Uh, because I'm writing, uh, running out of time, let me give you the third rather than the second phenomena, because this is something that was new to us that we just understood this year. Um, like about it, maybe it was a year ago, I forget when, some time ago, there was a paper published or at least posted by uh, three topologists called Oliver uh, uh, Gorchis, um, uh, Panagiotis Constantis and Leopold Zoller. And they showed two GKM spaces, two complexity one GKM spaces um, that have the same GKM graph, but where the total space is not, um, not the total spaces are not how to be equivalent. So the total, so they cannot possibly be um, isomorphic. So, and that illustrates that the GKM graph is not enough to, to determine the complexity one Hamiltonian T manifold. But when we stared at their example, we got really, really worried because in their example, each connected component of the skeleton was contractible. So we were under the impression that their example forces the painting to be trivial. And we, were, we got very worried. We said, well, either there's a mistake in what we expect to be proving for the short case, because their example did have short pieces, or their paper has a mistake. And for a long time, I was convinced that their paper has a mistake, and I was wrong. As far as we can see, the paper is correct. What turns out to be is that there's a new way in which the painting can be non-trivial that we're not aware of. So let me actually say this, a painting can be non-trivial even if the connected components of the skeleton are contractible.
And the reason is that when you do the equivalence relation is, this is not just up to homotopy abstractly, this is up to homotopy through paintings, and that gives you a restriction uh, on what can happen. And when the two pieces, okay, uh, uh, not trivial, I'm sorry, non-trivial um, painting uh, with skeleton. So it was really exciting to see this, that this is actually captured in the invariants that we already had, um, whose components are contractible. And the example you get is from CP1 cross CP3. So this is a um, um, three torus acting on an eight manifold. And let me draw the picture in one dimension less. And you get the interesting painting when, when that CP1 piece is kind of small. So that's the, uh, here, what I'm drawing here is a tetrahedron cross an interval, except that I don't have enough dimension. And what you see here is that um, uh, one piece of the skeleton, let me draw the skeleton. Here's one piece of the skeleton. And this one is contractible. Um, and this is just a, uh, um, uh, uh, again, I'm drawing it one dimension less. So this is like a, a, a triangle, if, if you do the correct dimension. And another piece of the skeleton is um, here. So this is just the sort of the top facets of a, of a tetrahedron and then something sticking out, like an, an, an interval sticking out. And each one of these separately is contractible, but the intersection between them has um, a, a non-trivial topology. In this two-dimensional picture, the intersection between these pictures, between, between like in the image, is two points. But in, in our higher dimension, that intersection is just the, the boundary of a triangle. And it turns out that if you take paintings up, if, up to homotopy through paintings, you actually get, uh, topologically speaking, you're gonna be looking at embedding uh, uh, maps from a, uh, so let me actually write this down. Um, paintings turn out to be uh, maps from a two, if, if you sort of stare at this long enough, map from a, a, a two disc to, uh, to S2, um, such that, the boundary goes to a point. And um, this turns out to, uh, th these guys, um, uh, it, it's not supposed to be obvious. It takes some time to stare at this before you can see that. And, and these maps are not all, of course, maps from the disk to S2 are all homotopic, but if you put that extra constraint, um, which is what you get to homotopically speaking, if you insist that the homotopy is through paintings, um, then you actually get the uh, non-isomorphic paintings. So that's a new phenomena that is captured by our old invariants, just we didn't realize until, until this year, which is kind of a nice sanity check um, for the uh, last part of the classification that uh, we expect to be proving. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. So thanks a lot. Um, please, questions or comments, you can either directly unmute yourself or you can raise your electronic hand. Hello, Yael. Yeah, actually, let me peek at the... Yes, I don't always recognize voices, so... Yes, who is that? Hello, it's me, Raya. Oh! Rayer. Hi, Rayer. Good to uh, see you. Hello. Yeah. Hello. The, the, these freckles you were talking about, uh, are they orbifold singularities or are they more complicated? Uh, more complicated. Hmm. Or maybe I should say I don't know. But even when you say orbifold singularities, you have to make a commitment on what sort of structure are you, are you looking at. So in your... so. I should have said, <laughs> I think I did mention that uh, reduced spaces being stratified symplectic spaces is, is done by Eugene Lerman and Ray Shama. But there's other stuff I was talking about before about the symplectic reduced space and the total area and stuff. And Rayer, um, let me give you, I, um, I don't know if I, I'm not seeing the picture here, I'm just seeing the list of names, but just in case you're gonna blush, you can put the camera on. Let me mention there's a paper of Ray where I really, really, really like, which analyzes, which have, you know, talks about um, um, differential forms on reduced spaces. 
And a lot of what I was saying before is actually uh, rigorous, not heuristic, thanks to, to Ray's paper about differential forms and things like on review spaces. Um, beautiful paper, beautiful notion of forms, like they're not manifolds, but, but very good uh, theory of, of differential forms on, it, on them. Also raises some interesting open question, but that's a different story. But um, yeah, but then the question, if you wanna ask, are they overfalls, you need to even ask, you, you need to, you know, what, what do you mean by is, right? Uh, but yeah, I, I don't, the answer is that I don't know. Like, okay, fine. <laughs> okay. Okay, more questions? Oh, maybe I should say maybe I should say something about that. Uh, because hold on, hold on. Maybe I should say something about that, because um, because there are they are situation they are, there are situation where they are. Because if you look at a toric stratum inside the big symplectic manifold, in the special case that the momentum image of the toric stratum was of the same dimension as, um, as that of the original uh, manifold, in that case, um, in, the, um, um, in, the, uh, in that case, that, that stratum does contribute to overflow singularities. I'm sorry, I should, I should have said that. It's, it's the lower dimensional ones which can be worse. So in the picture I drew here, um, we only see, uh, the, uh, uh, the, in, in the picture that I've, that I've drawn here, um, the, the uh, uh, toric strata, their image are, uh, images are intervals, and this is inside R2, so like they're not contributing over folds, at least not in any obvious way. But there are situations where the image is an actual thing of full dimension, and that will contribute to overflow points. Okay, that was a long answer to short question. Great, thank you. Okay, more, more questions, long or short? Uh, hi, Yael, this is QMERS. Just hi, QMERS. To ask, uh, ask uh, if uh, you have compared your classification with the algebraic version of oh, it. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And this is sort of, this, this, is, this is harsh business. So we have talked with Klaus Altman and some of his people. Uh, these, it, it's, it's, and in fact, at some point, I forget if it was Klaus Altman and maybe someone else actually had someone take a look at this. This is, this is tricky business. So there's this whole industry, this whole sequence of papers that talk about, and in fact, the reason we call them complexity one is because of these algebraic geometers. We used to call, like a million years ago, we used to call them deficiency one, which is a name I like, I like better. Uh, but um, th then we found out about these works by algebraic geometers and they would use the word complexity once. So we adapted their terminology to use the same word. So these guys have a notion of complexity one for uh, in a complex situation, their groups are, are uh, complex. Um, they're acting on varieties, not just manifolds, but actually varieties. Everything is algebraic. Uh, the groups are not necessarily abelian. So that's a way more general situation than us. And they do have, uh, but, and, but they don't have a two form. They don't have a two form. So, so, so for example, in, you know, the, in the Delzant case, this would, the, the, you know, the algebraic thing is they work with fans and, 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 and we will work with polytopes. So there's something about passing between fans and polytopes. So they do have these fans floating around that are uh, similar to the little uh, polytopes that we have, which are the images of the uh, toric strata. Um, but it's, it, it, one thing that they, they're not going to have is this notion of a painting, because that's truly is a non, like you don't get that in the uh, yes, uh, that, algebraic that, that case, that the Taylor case. Yeah. In their picture. But yeah, but, but I'm not aware that anyone actually sat down to do the translation in, in a, in a, in a, in a Systematic way. I can suggest a paper of Ilten Sus, uh, which is called mm -hmm. Polarized uh, Complexity One T Varieties. Oh, so, po is that polarized in the sense that it's embedded in some like in the project? It has a very like, ample with a, with line bundle, choice. yes. Oh, so it beautiful. would correspond beautiful. to choice of and that the, would the, the gadget they, they use, the, the gadget they use is called uh, uh, the divisor, the uh, divisor. I forget, they have two words. Polyhedral? No, they have divisorial polytube. <laughs> I think that's oh, what fantastic. they say. Yeah. 
because again, I, I forget. What, did they have the Zoriel fans in the previous versions? I don't uh, the, in the Altman they, and others. This is classification yeah. of T varieties, so they don't have the symplectic formal polarization. No, no, of course, but they do have yes. fans. So, for yes, example, yes, they have in fans their situation, so yeah, so in their situation, devices, like, yeah. yeah. In their situation, like let's think about complex analytic. In the complex analytic case, if you take the complex, let's let's do the torus case. Oh, in that paper, was it a torus or non-abelian? No, you know torus. Torus. Oh, so Taurus. that was because they have like big, big, big generality. But let's do the toric case, um, the complexified torus. If if everything was clear, you would have a complexified torus action, and its orbit will give you one of these trivializations of the geometric quotient. And this goes back mm -hmm. to like, ideas of Atia from his initial convexity paper. So in the and so in that case, you actually get a, a trivialization. Um, in that case, each piece of the each connected component of the skeleton will sort of sit over one point in 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 the reduced space. So you can think of this as sort of living over a complex Riemann surface and over certain points of the surf surface or certain divisors, um, you're going to be having these sort of combination of, of, of uh, convex polytopes. Um, but it, no, I, so from what year is that paper? Um, okay. You remember? Uh, it's re relatively recent, I think. Yeah, Two, okay. yeah it's 2000, 2011, mm -hmm. 2011. Nice, no, I would love, Oh, 2011. Ah, yes. and what is the name again? So, I, I can email you. It's uh, called yeah. Polarized Complexity One okay, T Varieties. Fantastic. fantastic. No, I would love to see that. I think that when we talked to these guys, that conversation was probably in 2009 in a conference in 2009. Mm -hmm. But I think they were aware of the, you know, I think they were already aware of the, you know, relation between these. Um, circles of ideas. No, I would love to get the reference. Thank you. I was not aware of that okay. one. Thank you. So, yeah, uh, excuse me for butting in, but isn't it the case that there are many symplectic complexity one spaces which do not carry any compatible algebraic structure? Or Correct. Or structure? Okay. Correct. So for example, if you take one of these guys with a non-trivial painting, uh, that will not admit a compatible Cato structure. And one could ask, and I think it's extremely interesting to ask, uh, so, so uh, uh, whether uh, the existence of an intranatural painting, is it sufficient for having a competitive Kelly structure? I think I don't know. I think I don't know. But even it being necessary, that's like one of these things. I don't think it's written down in a very careful way, but whatever, but that's sort of in some sense in a TS paper, but whatever. But, but being sufficient is definitely an, a, a, a question. Like, is triviality of the painting, does that guarantee existence of a compatible cable structure? I don't know. Possibly. <laughs> I, would, I, would ins I, I, I would insist on compare just to, be, just to start. OK, thank you. More questions? Hi, Ariel, oh, this is oh, hold on, hold on. And an answer to the question I've just posed could potentially uh, come, oh, in the integral case. If the two form is integral, then an answer could come from that paper that Kumar just told me about. But, the, the, but, the, but the, you know, one would expect the answer to be hopefully positive, even without assuming integrality of the two form. Yeah, I'm sorry, who, who was asking another question? Yes, uh, yeah, this is Tudor. Hello, Tudor, how are you? you? I hear you. Uh, I, I just want to ask you, did you ever think of how to apply all of this to Hamiltonian bifurcation theory? Because these are systems that barely fail to be integral, right? You have just yeah. one. So uh, I, I, I might not happen. answer, yeah. I might not answer your questions precisely, but let me say something that might be relevant because I'm not totally sure what you mean by Hamiltonian bifurcation theorem, but let me say two things. First of all, topologically, the reduced spaces stay the same, but there is very, very interesting stuff around completely integrable systems on these guys. Like if you have like these, uh, you know, the, this component of the momentum map, add one more function to get a completely integrable system. So I don't know if this is, so I can say some comments about that. I don't know if that will be responding to your question or not. No, I mean, this is, this is part of it, of course. It's, uh, it's yeah. not, they're very interesting because right there, there, there are those uh, Pelayo 
Van Gogh in various That's correct. Types, That's correct. That would That's be correct. very interesting to know how you are. Uh, absolutely. Different. Absolutely. Uh, so I can make two, I can make two comments of that. So first of all, those uh, semi toric. So in the in dimension four, the uh, semi uh, I, I forgot what they call them. So, what did they call them? Semi toric. Semi toric. Semi toric system of of Pileo and and Van Gogh. Um, uh, I mean, you can, okay, so let me say a word about this. Um, if you have a completely integrable system of which n minus one components are com the components of a complexity one uh, momentum map, and the remaining component will just put some commutes with these guys, the way that you want to think of these guys, you want to think of that additional component as a real valued function on the reduced spaces. You want to think of it as a reduced space comes with a real valued function and it can vary as a, as a reduced space varies. So topologically, it does not change. But still, you know, you're moving from point to point, and the function could change in possibly interesting ways. And the the, the semi-toric assumptions of Pileo and Van Gogh give sort of strict restrictions on what how that additional function could look like. So first of all, viewing their systems as complexity one um, uh, manifolds equipped with an additional function, and seeing how that you know, um, and how what does that have to do with the classification? This was analyzed by some very nice papers. I hope I'm not gonna. For, I might. I don't. Not sure if I'm gonna remember the all the authors. Uh, I think you know definitely um, uh, Daniela Seppa, um, Sonia Hochlock, um, Margaret right. Symington, and I may have forgotten. Was it Sylvia Sabatini? Maybe. I'm not sure. I think there was more people involved. Can someone in the audience tell me if I forgot? Holger Dulin. Sylvia. I'm sorry. Sylvia is also involved. Yeah, I did mention. Oh, is Daniela the is there? Paper. Oh, Daniela, do you want to say a few words? <laughs> um, you, you can better than I can. <laughs> no, you can better than I can. <laughs> so but, first of all, did I get the names right? Correct. Because um, you have a whole sequence of papers with. Um, correct, correct. And essentially, we 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 go back and forth between their classification and the classification that you obtained for Hammerstein and S one spaces. So we, and, yeah. Okay. And so this is for dimension four, but can you actually say a few words to Tudor about your project with Sue, with Sue Tolman, the current oh. project that you're working on? And uh, I forget, is this together with, is this also with, with Joey? Just, uh, just, Homer, I, or? So maybe Joey is also here. I can speak about. I'm also here, yes. Yeah. So, so Joey, you, go ahead, Joey. Oh, well, so, um, I mean, I'm doing something similar with Sue, but not the same as what Daniela is doing with, with Sue, I guess, is the, um, the short answer. I mean, Daniela was doing, uh, was doing something first about these uh, ephemeral points, I guess, and, and lifting and things like this. Um, so I don't know, maybe you should say, should say something first. I mean, I can say a few words. I, like the, my impression was, and I just heard very little about it, but the little I heard from Sue sounds really exciting which is that Sue together with Joey Palmer and, and with Daniel Seppa, and if there's more collaborators, please remind me, are analyzing uh, completely integrable um, systems on these guys. And it turns out that in this context, it turns out to be very, very natural to look at the new type of singularity of completely integrable system that is not part of, I think, the usual classification, but that comes up very, very naturally in this context. And they have some kind of really nice analysis of what can happen with such completely integral system. But um, I think Joey or Daniela will be able to say something better than me. So yeah, so the, the um, I mean, the, the, the project you're mentioning is what is what Daniela is doing with um, mm -hmm. Sue, with these sort of new singularities. Um, and the project that, that I'm doing with Sue is a little bit different. We're looking at um, uh, the case that the integrable system is is non-degenerate, so it doesn't have sort of these special um, uh, different singularities that can show up. Um, I, I guess the the point is that if you have more complicated complexity one spaces, um, then it's uh, it's sort of too hopeful to hope that you can lift it to an integrable system where everything's non-degenerate. Um, and so, yeah. So I, uh, with her, I'm looking at the case. Um, when can you lift it to something that's non-degenerate? And, um, and, and my, uh, my understanding is that Daniela and her are talking about lifting uh, a broader class of systems and including some singularities that are 
Uh, yeah, very natural, but, but sort of different than what other people have thought about, I think. But, but these are something, Daniela, these are new types of singularities that you and Sue came up with, is this right? The, 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 no. I, no? Okay, I so think, fine. Yeah, no, so these things, in at least in Dimension 4, came up uh, with... Um, when people looked at some systems that give rise to something that in the literature is known as fractional monodromy. Um, uh -huh. So you have resonances different. So in, in the cemetery case, the weights are necessarily plus or minus one for these uh, freckles, essentially, right? I mean, um, and uh, in, the, in, in high, I mean, what we're looking at is allowing for more complicated weights. So, you know, M and minus N. So, so sorry, uh -huh. people. So it's a very nice discussion, but I, I still don't 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 quite understand. Like, uh, for instance, from Pilayo, Wungok invariance, can one get invariance? Yeah, that uh, like in that case, four-dimensional case, right? Can one read your whatever freckles and surfaces and map of skeleton, or can one go the other way around? Yes, yes, and this and this and yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, so, uh, b b yeah, even before you ask this, there's a preliminary question to ask because in the case of circle action of four manifolds, I have some earlier piece of work, earlier classification that uses slightly different language than this one. So the first question to ask is, you know, how do you, you know, how, do, how, how does this picture uh, match the earlier picture of Hamiltonian uh, circle actions on symplectic four manifolds? Um, oops, did I just lose my... Yeah, sorry. Never mind. Um, there we go. So the first question is to sort of match between these two pictures. Um, uh, for example, in the four-dimensional case, all the paintings are trivial. Uh, now, second, but once you look at the older results on uh, Hamiltonian uh, circle actions on symplectic four manifolds, then there is the work of um, um, uh, uh, um, Dan Daniela and uh, Sylvia and Margaret and Sonia, which um, goes back and forth. You can actually go back and forth between the uh, uh, Pelayo uh, von Gogh on the one hand and the uh, circle actions and, and four manifolds on the other hand. So invariance in that case, invariance are equivalent. There is a dictionary between invariance. Uh, Daniela, do interrupt if I'm saying things that are wrong. So it's it's not well. They, they do have more information because they equip these guys with additional structure. They actually fix an additional mm -hmm. uh, component for the complete integrable system. So they they capture more information. But ex you know beyond that, there's a it goes back and forth. Uh, and yeah, again, Daniela, from, please fix me. But then logically, from their invariance, one can read yours. Yeah, and this was done by Daniela and mm -hmm. and Sylvia. And uh, so again, Danielle, am I right with the names? Danielle, Sylvia, Sonia, and Margaret, is this correct? So the, the one way, so going the, let's say, losing information we did just with Sylvia and Sonia, mm -hmm. construct, reconstruct, you know, lifting, if you wish, is joined mm -hmm. with Margaret as well, yes. So the lifting means that you start with the complexity one manifold in dimension four, and then you build the completely integral system on it. Is this so, correct? Yes, but, so in the in the losing information, we determined necessary conditions on the complexity one space to come from uh, a mm -hmm. semi system. So, for instance, yeah. the reduced surface has to be a sphere. Oh, actually, that's an excellent comment. Like, you know, that not every complexity one manifold will admit that. Uh, um, um, the com complete integral system of the type considered by Pelayo and Von Gogh. And I think that this is one of the reasons that you and Sue were looking at these more general complete integral systems. Mm -hmm. oh, so so you, you, you're saying it, the, the surface must be a sphere? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. okay. Yes. And in, then, order f in, in order to satisfy the assumptions of Pelayo and Von Gogh. Okay. Okay. Sounds very good. Thank you. So, Tudor, does this answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, certainly. Uh, I mean, I, I was slightly more ambitious and you know, I was really thinking you have a family of Hamiltonians depending on a parameter, you let it run. Ah, right? I understand. Oh, okay. I mean, so I, you know, you yeah, know, it's I the see. real thing, the real difficult thing, right? And then let's see what happens with the parameter change. No, no, I, I understand. So, so you, you want to, you know, I understand, you want to throw in an extra parameter. Yeah. 
And, then and what I think that this is a I think this is a fantastic question. I like the question. <laughs> it's very difficult. I can tell you, I've been knocking my head on it for a while. Yeah, no, I like this question. I don't have an answer, but I like the question. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thanks a lot. I don't know whether there are further questions or comments. If, if not, let's thank you all again. Okay, thank you very much. There is one important announcement. Of course, we also send you a message. Uh, so the talk next week, may, perhaps many of you saw the name of Jim Stashev announced for next week, but now it ch changed. Jim uh, had to shift his talk to mid-December. Actually, his talk will be the last in Global Poisson uh, in 2021. And instead, next week, it will be Anton is awesome of speaking. Ah. So I think, uh, right, Nikita will send the announcement early next week. Well, thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you again, Yael. And uh, okay, thank you. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you, Yael. Bye.